All right. Good morning, everybody. Uh, we'll begin our webinar now. I hope everything is going well and you can all hear, hear me okay. Um, to begin with, uh, we're going to talk about just a little bit about an overview of how to best update to 2.5. 2.5 is a major upgrade. It's not just a, a tweak. It's a major upgrade. And so for major upgrades, especially this one, we recommend that you deactivate your software and you install the upgrade and then you reactivate your software to avoid any activation problems or anything like that. Major upgrades of this type, in fact any upgrade to your Windows operating system or to Darkroom Booth are never a good idea uh, just before an event. It's never a good idea to do that. It's always best to do that when you have plenty of time to work out any problems that you may have. Uh, you know, locate your activation code and things like that so you can uh, have a smooth transition and everything up and working and give yourself time to uh, try out the new features and, and uh, work with those before you get to an event. Most people who have problems by uh, upgrading are people who do it just before an event and don't have time to work out small issues and they end up, uh, you know, in a desperate plea for help because uh, they have an event in an hour and that was just not a good idea to do an upgrade like that. So always do those when you have several days uh, and preferably during um, Monday through Friday so that our office staff is open and available to help out if you have a problem. So that's the best way to uh, have a smooth upgrade process. Uh, that also applies by the way for things like upgrading to Windows 10 and major upgrades like that as well. It's always a good idea to deactivate do your upgrade and then reactivate and then also allow yourself plenty of time to work out any bugs or issues that you might have with a major upgrade like that. Uh, first thing we're going to talk about is slow motion video. This is a major new feature that was added to 2.5. Slow motion video is available. Uh, it's very simple to implement and it is also available with just about any camera that supports video recording. Now, that said, some cameras are better suited to slow motion video than others. For example, most of the mid-range Nikon SLRs, like the uh, 5100, 5200, 5300, you can do slow motion video with those. That option is in the software. However, those cameras only record at 30 frames per second, which is a very slow, you know, it's a normal frame rate for normal video. But when you slow that down, uh, we'll say, you know, by 10 times or something, then you're playing that back at three frames a second and it you know, doesn't give you a very smooth uh, product. So those aren't necessarily best suited for uh, slow motion video. On the other hand, most Canon cameras uh, will do at least 60 frames a second and that works much better. Actually, the Canon T5 and T6 work really well. They, uh, they require no conversion to play back and they play back almost instantly. Uh, so that they work really well uh, with those. We also added support for um, GoPro cameras. So GoPro cameras uh, also work great for slow motion video because of their higher frame rates. Most GoPro cameras can do 120 frames a second. Uh, some of them uh, can do 240 frames a second. And these higher frame rates like that, when played back at standard speed, produce a much smoother slow motion um, effect. Uh, they do have some drawbacks. The GoPro cameras connect by Wi-Fi, not by USB. So if you've attempted that and, and not had good results, or it couldn't connect to the camera, and you were trying to do that with a USB cable, that's the problem. Those cameras are designed by the manufacturer to work by Wi-Fi. And so the way you set up a GoPro camera is you um, connect it by Wi-Fi. The camera itself makes its own Wi-Fi network and you connect the computer to that Wi-Fi network. And then you start Darkroom booth and it will show the, uh, the Wi-Fi GoPro in the, uh, the camera tab. So when you, uh, you get to that camera tab, now obviously I, I can't display all of those kind of things, but this is what you'll see under video settings. And this is true with both a uh, uh, GoPro and uh, a Nikon camera or anything else. First of all, you'll see this in your setup and you'll see the uh, 
allow videos to be emailed. This is a feature that is coming soon. We'll have that available for you soon. It's not working just right now, but it will be available soon. Then you can also set the resolution of the video with a GoPro camera. With Nikon and Canon, those are set in the camera menus themselves. And then you can set the frames per second with the, uh, the GoPro cameras. The next thing you'll see is playback frame rate. This is where you determine the actual speed that the video is going to be played back at. Uh, the default is 10x, but you can drop that menu down and you can set 8 or 7 or 5 or whatever you feel like works best for you. Uh, we just marked the 10x as the default, and uh, that gives a really nice slow motion effect. So you can just set that as a drop down, and then you've got the slow motion set to do that. Uh, the next thing you'd want to do is determine what you want to do with that video. Uh, you can do a couple of things. You can play that back in the slideshow. So if you go into the slideshow setup, you'll see a checkbox right here. I'm pointing to it. Let me get a little tool that will show up. Here we go. See this uh, show videos right here? You can see that. It's a checkbox. So if you check that box, it will add the uh, slow motion videos to the slideshow. And that's a really nice effect. Someone gets in the booth, they do a, sl a slow motion video, they get out, and then they go and see it on their screen, the, the big screen, and, and display it to the whole crowd. And that can be quite an entertaining feature. The next thing that you can do is you can also have that playback immediately after the um, session. So if you go, and the way you do that is here in the screens setup, this is a sample screen that comes with Darkroom that is already set up to do both video and still photos. But if you click edit and you choose your button where you enabled your video and you double click on it, you'll see the booth command, video session. If I check that box, there's another box right here that says enable video playback. If you check that box right there, then at the end of the video recording session, it will, uh, in the case of slow motion, it will convert the video to slow motion and then play it back on the main screen, full screen, immediately afterwards. With GoPro camera, that re does require conversion, so it takes a few seconds, and that is dependent on the speed of your computer. If you're using an i5 uh, or an i3 processor, that usually takes for a five-second video, uh, you know, 30 seconds or so. Uh, if you're using a T5 or a T6 camera, those record in a format that does not require conversion, and so that's near instant, uh, just almost instantly displays it on the screen. The uh, GoPro cameras take a little bit longer to transfer by Wi-Fi and then also require conversion to playback. Now, also, if you go, I'm going to go back out of this, and I'm going to go over here to the slideshow section again. In the slideshow, if you have this, the show videos checked, then it will convert those videos and save them in the uh, slideshow folder uh, as, a, as a slow motion video. If you click right up here on this Manage button and open slideshow folder, then it will open that folder Hello? Can anybody hear me? <sighs> Wonder why. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning. This is uh, Wally with Darkroom Software. We're just doing a quick sound check, and we'll be ready to go here in just a second. Testing one, two. Okay. We've got that audio problem worked out, and we'll start over from the top. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. 
Uh, first of all, I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, tips for upgrading. We do recommend with this is a major upgrade. Darkroom 2.5 is a major upgrade. It's not just a slight tweak. It's a major upgrade. And so we do strongly recommend that you deactivate your software and then reactivate it after you install the update. Uh, and that's a that's a good practice you know for any sort of a major update if you want to deactivate your software you would go here to the uh, global settings and then system info section click on this link right here deactivate this computer enter in your booth code if you don't know your booth code you can contact where you purchased the software if you purchased a ready-built booth with the software pre-installed and activated you can contact the booth builder where you purchased the booth from they should have a record of that and uh, they can provide you with the code if you purchased it from darkroom direct and you no longer know what the code is you can contact our support staff and we can find that for you so if you enter in your code and then return license right here then that will return your license if you don't know that code but you remember the password that you used or created when you set it up you can also enter in that password there as well and it will display the code and that's a good tool for locating that code as well. Once you deactivate the uh, software, then you can download and install the, uh, the new update and then reactivate your software. With any sort of major upgrade like this, it is always a good idea to do this during the week when you don't have any events going on, when you have several days to work out any problems or issues and learn the software. And it is always a good idea to do that when you can have access to our support staff. That's true for any sort of major upgrade, like if you upgrade to Windows 10 or anything else. Never a good idea to do that with just a few hours before an event. You want to have plenty of time to work out any problems or issues before you make any sort of major upgrade to your, uh, your booth computer, your software. All right, once you do that upgrade, then you can go in and uh, start working with all the fun new features. We're going to talk about most of those today. The first one that we want to talk about is the uh, slow motion video. This is a new exciting feature. One of the things that we had as a goal for slow motion video was to be able to do that with the camera that you currently have. Instead of going and investing $10,000 in an expensive high-end video camera, we wanted to allow you to uh, do the slow motion effect with cameras that you already have. So the slow motion effect is available with um, most uh, any camera that supports recording video uh, webcams don't because they just uh, they just can't do that but uh, SLRs like Canon and Nikon there are a few uh, problems not every camera is ideally suited for slow motion video uh, for example the uh, mid-range Nikon cameras like the 5000 series the 5100 the 5200 5300 those only record video at 30 frames per second. That's standard video, and it's not uh, ideally suited for slow motion because typically with slow motion video, you want to record it at a much higher than normal frame rate, and then you play it back at normal frame rates, and you get the slow motion effect. Uh, when you do that with cameras that only record at regular frame rates, then the effect is blurred and not quite as, as dramatic. But... Um, some of the Nikon higher-end cameras do record higher video than that. And also most Canon cameras like the T5, T6, T3, most all of those will record at 60 frames per second. The uh, Canon T5 and T6 are really kind of unique because they record in a video format that doesn't require conversion. So that can be played back on the screen near instantly. It transfers very fast by USB. GoPros, on the other hand, GoPros uh, will only connect by Wi-Fi. So the way you connect a GoPro camera is not by USB, but you connect it by Wi-Fi. So the camera itself, the GoPro camera, creates its own Wi-Fi network. Then you join your computer to that Wi-Fi network, and in that Wi-Fi network, that will connect the camera. The camera transfers the video to the computer by Wi-Fi, and then the software converts the video and plays it back on screen. Now, there's a few disadvantages to that. 
uh, the GoPro does record at higher frame rates, 120 frames per second, and in some cases up to 240 frames per second, depending on which model camera you have. But the um, the GoPros, by transferring by US by Wi-Fi instead of USB, are inherently slower and do require conversion. So it might be, depending on your your uh, CPU, if you have an i5 or maybe an i3, it might take 30 to 45 seconds before that video is converted and ready to play back on screen. In most cases with video, uh, slow motion, you're going to want to restrict the time of your recording to somewhere in the neighborhood of three to five seconds. That seems pretty short, but if you keep in mind when you slow that video down ten times, that five second video is now almost a minute long and that takes quite a while to play. So you want to keep that uh, relatively short and let people do something quickly and then play it back in slow motion. Some of the things that work best for uh, slow motion video are things that have motion in them, bright colors and things like that that you can see moving. Uh, and if someone's just standing there, it's not a very dramatic effect. <laughs> okay. Now, the way you enable that slow motion video, and I'm going to, once you get your camera connected, either GoPro or Canon or whatever, if you look here on this screen, you'll see a new item in the video section called Playback Frame Rate. And you can set that to 10x as our set default, but you can also adjust it to anything in between. It can be, you know, 5 or 6 or whatever x slower that you want to do. You can play with that until you find the right setting that you feel like gives you the best uh, view that you like. We felt like 10x worked really well, so that's what we set as the default. But you just set that to uh, you know 10x, and uh, then when your video is done, it will be played back in slow motion. Now, the way you set it up to play is two places. First of all, in the screen itself, and if you go in here, you'll find a preset screen. This one right here, you can you know change the way it looks a little bit if you'd like, but this one is preset up for video and still photos. So with this screen, you can switch back and forth choosing still or video. If you're using an SLR, then the camera can be set up to use flash for the still and continuous light for the video. If you're using a GoPro, they don't work with flash. You have to use continuous light. But the GoPro does actually do a pretty nice job at taking a still photo. Now, the way you would set that up to play that back is in the, the button. If you look right here, you'll see the button that you press to do the video session. Double click on that and where you would add the booth command for video session, you can just click edit and choose enable video playback. If you do that, then when the video is finished recording, transferring and converting, it will display on your main screen, your main booth screen in full screen playback and in slow motion if you're doing slow motion. So that's how you would enable that to play back on the main screen. You can also play that back in the slideshow. So if you go to the slideshow setup, enable the slideshow, and down here a little further, you can click on the checkbox that says show videos. Let me get a little highlighter here so maybe you can see that a little better. If you look right here, show videos. Okay, check that box, and then the video itself after its conversion is uh, saved in slow motion and played back on the screen uh, in slow motion in the slideshow. This is a great option because, uh, you know, it's all about entertainment and people would be able to see the videos just rolling and scrolling by on the, uh, the big screen. Now, to find those videos, if you want to, uh, to locate them afterwards and maybe burn them to a disk or something, you can click up here on Manage, Open Slideshow Folder, and in that slideshow folder, bring this right over here, you will find videos like this one right here. And those are the ones that are slideshow or slow motion. They'll, they'll have video, in this case video 3, and ALT. That means alternate, not the, the standard video, but the uh, slow motion video. And that's how you would find those after the session was over. Okay. So you just check that box and add those to your slideshow. Uh, you can also have other options if you wanted to play the slideshows, you know, mixed in with the uh, still photos, etc. So you can do that there.
All right, as I mentioned earlier, GoPro cameras do set up by Wi-Fi. We get a lot of calls from people trying to plug them in USB, but they do set up by Wi-Fi. So you create the Wi-Fi network, you join that Wi-Fi network with your computer, and then you uh, restart the software, and it will detect the, the GoPro camera and display all the controls for the GoPro camera. All right, now then, another exciting new feature that we have is booth control. Uh, booth control, the way you set booth control up is in the global settings section and you'll see a new option right here called booth control. Now in booth control, I'm going to open a uh, setup screen so you can see how that works. But in booth control, it's really pretty simple. You just check the box for enable booth control and then once you get that enabled, then you can just find, and in my case I have several adapters, but you want the main one. And this would be the IP address that you would use to go to that particular booth control. Now, I'm going to slide this over here. And this gives you a link and shows you things like to get to the slideshow, the kiosk, and we'll talk about more than that in just a minute. But it's all basically the IP address and then you type slideshow, kiosk, etc. So that IP address is listed in the software. Once you do that, then you'll see a screen like this right here. Just one second, let me pull up my booth control screen. Here we go. So this is what it would look like on your cell phone, okay? It shows the name of the computer, the event name, and then various controls and so on for booth control. Now then we also have, here we go. Booth control. All right, here's booth control. So there's the IP address. You just open your device on the same Wi-Fi network and you type in that IP address. If you typed only the IP address, then that IP address would take you to the slideshow. Uh, but if you type in like slash menu, then slash menu would take you to the, uh, the menu screen. Let me get over to a menu screen. Here we go. Here's our menu screen. So if you type the IP address slash M-E-N-U menu, you'll see this on your phone or your tablet. So you can choose here to see the slideshow, here to do a kiosk mode, here to get survey results. This one right here, I'm going to get a highlighter so you can see that a little better. Uh, photo control we'll talk about in just a little bit. Uh, more. Uh, booth controls, custom controls, manage album, etc. And I'm going to explain just a little bit of the differences between all of these. First of all, the slideshow, the very first one up here, slideshow, that's the same slideshow that you would normally see on a second monitor. So if you wanted to be able to do a remote slideshow without wires or anything, you can just plug a separate laptop, computer, tablet, etc. into your uh, big screen TV, projector, whatever and then put it on the uh, the Wi-Fi network and then type the IP address and go to the slideshow and that will be the same slideshow that is displayed on the second monitor if you want to do that remotely without wires. The next option down is the kiosk mode. Now the kiosk mode adds uh, a couple of really unique features and it gives you a social media sharing station. We call it actually booth share. And what BoothShare does is BoothShare gives you this option right here. So with BoothShare, you can see the individual image. You'll see thumbnails, and you can select an individual image. And then when you select the individual image, at the bottom of the screen, you'll see an icon for email, an icon for text messaging, and an icon for reprinting. Now all of these options are selectable. In other words, if you don't want to offer reprints to the customers, you can turn that off. If you only want to uh, offer email, you can turn that uh, the other two off. So it's just a checkbox in the booth control setup, and you can choose what you want to offer. Uh, the, uh, the nice thing about this is they get out of the booth, they go to the kiosk, they can browse through all the past photos for the the evening. They can email it to themselves, they can text it to themselves, and they can reprint that if they want to. Now, you do have to have accounts set up for email and text. The text messaging does require a Twilio account. 
and uh, for email you'd have to have an email send account. So you have to have those set up. The emails are actually coming from the actual photo booth, uh, not from the tablet. So you do have to have you know some internet connection for that, uh, but you can also you know, send reprints and things like that back to the booth, and all of this can be done uh, remotely. All right, now I'm going to go back here. Okay, now uh, the uh, the kiosk or booth share is a great feature, and it allows you to do all of that from uh, from a remote station. Now the next option down is survey results. Uh, if you're doing a survey, you can pull up remotely and see what your survey results are, how many people answered this question, which way, and things like that. So that's kind of a cool option if you're doing survey results. And all of that can be seen on your cell phone or your tablet. Uh, one thing I do want to point out, because this works with an IP address and a web browser, then any device, anything that can browse to a website can be used for this purpose. You can use an iPhone, an Android tablet, an Android phone, anything that you can join the Wi-Fi network and browse to an IP address. And so that's a big advantage. There's no specific device. You can use inexpensive or old devices. You don't have to install any apps on those. There's also um, a number of kiosk full screen type browsers available for both Android and iPhone and Windows. Uh, that you can find. You can just do a search on the uh, App Store or something like that for Kiosk Browser and you'll find lots of different options there, some free, some paid, that allow you to do that in full screen and not show the address bar. <clears throat> now the next option down, uh, something that we're also excited about is what we call Photo Control. Photo Control allows you to have this screen right here so as soon as you see a session uh, someone does a session in your photo booth, right away after the picture is taken, it displays on your phone. So you can monitor what's going on in the booth, see if anybody's doing anything inappropriate or something they shouldn't be doing. And you can also uh, cancel the session right there. So if, if they're doing something that you, know, you don't want them to do, you can cancel the session and cause them to not be able to complete that session. They can just uh, end it right away. So that's what booth or uh, photo control does. It displays the actual photograph taken on your tablet, device, phone, whatever. It allows you to monitor what's going on in the booth. Uh, over on this left side you'll see booth controls. Booth controls gives you a number of options where you can completely control the booth just like you would put touch screen buttons on your booth. Um, you can control it just like that. You can change color, black and white, sepia, antique. You can start cancel, retake, etc. You can change the templates. Well, a big advantage of this is if you don't have a touch screen. A lot of times people are having difficulty figuring out what they want to do to set up their uh, their photo booth with all of these fun options but they don't have a touch screen. And so you can do this without a touch screen and uh, display uh, and, and do all these different things within the photo booth. Another uh, great thing about this is people who want to control the booth themselves. I hear people all the time that say, I don't want people to touch my booth. I want to be able to turn it on, start the session, etc. myself. This way you can do that. Just don't put any buttons on the screen and control it all from right back uh, on your phone like this. Okay, so booth control. That gives you a lot of advantages there. Um, over just below booth control you'll see manage album. Manage album is a great feature and it adds one very important thing if you look right down here in the corner. In addition to all of the options just like you would have in the normal booth share mode, it adds a thing right here. It's a little trash, trash can so that if you want to remove a photo from the slideshow, it doesn't actually remove it from your computer, it just removes it from the slideshow. So if someone comes up and says, hey, that picture is not really good of me, I don't want that in the slideshow, you can just scroll through, find the image, and click on the trash can and remove it from the slideshow. So that's a great added feature in the, uh, the Manage Album section. Um, just below Manage Album is Menu. That takes you back to that main, this, this same main menu that you see right here. Then um, across from that is Links. That's just spelled out for you, all the different um, ways to get to these things if you want to without using the buttons. Then there's display stats above that. That's this one right here, display stats. Display stats gives you the opportunity to see and monitor what's going on in your booth, and I'll show you what that looks like. 
there's a display slat screen. Uh, if you look on here, you can see things like how many sessions have been done, what the average time is, how many idle minutes you've had or seconds, how many photographs have been taken, etc. cetera. Uh, it also will display things like how much paper is remaining if you're using a printer that we have a direct driver for, like the DMP printers or the Brav of 21 printers. That can be a great advantage to you so you can keep track of how much paper is remaining and not run out of paper unexpectedly at a bad time. Uh, nothing, nothing worse than having the bride and groom get in the booth for the first time in the middle of the night and uh, suddenly you're out of paper and you have to change paper. So that way you can kind of keep an eye on it and monitor how much uh, paper is remaining. And that's what we call booth stats. Uh, just above booth stats is another exciting thing called custom controls. Now custom controls are really nice, I think. If you look at this screen right here, within the global settings section under automation and device control, this is it right here, automation and device control, it's figure one. You can click on add input over here on the right and then give it a name. Uh, the name would be just, you know, for your own prompting and your own information. And you can add a sound or a video or a fidget relay to turn on something and add any of those things to the, uh, the booth control menu. And when you do that, you add custom controls and they look something like this. So if you had, uh, you know, some, some funny sounds, sound effects, things like that, that you wanted to randomly play during the booth session to cause people to you know laugh or make a funny face or maybe a video that you wanted to pop up and say hey you know you're not having much fun here you need to smile more well you can add those things right there and they're all random whenever you press the button that's when they would play they interrupt the the normal operation of the booth and play those things so that's a really cool option to add some you know randomness and some excitement to your booth and you can use that to turn on things turn off things and so on. All right. Another exciting thing that you can do with the photo booth in the uh, booth control section, if you look down here, is the booth lock. Let me get a highlighter so you can see. See this right here? Booth lock. So with booth lock, you have a situation in the middle of the, the event where you want to uh, make the booth not available for a period of time. Uh, for example, let's say the bride and groom are going to have dinner and they don't want anybody in the booth during dinner or maybe a toast or something like that. You can click on booth lock and booth lock will display a screen that says enter the amount of time. You put in the time, let's say 20 minutes, and then click OK and it will uh, display a lock screen that says, you know, the booth is not available, we'll be back in 15 minutes, you know, and just the, does a countdown of how many minutes remaining. And then when you're ready to bring it back into operation, you can click on the booth lock right next to it, or booth unlock right next to it, and that will bring the booth back into operation. Maintenance lock works in a very similar fashion, only maintenance lock does not display the remaining time. It just simply says the booth is not available at this time. Uh, so that uh, if you, you know, need to change paper or you know, something like that, and you just want to make the booth unavailable where people won't be using it during that time, you can just click maintenance lock, and that will lock them out of the booth. Uh, that's, an, that's a great feature there. So you don't have to shut everything down. You can just click on booth lock and, and uh, make it unavailable for just a minute. Okay, uh, let me see here. We've talked about booth stats. We've talked about booth share. We've talked about booth control. Um, Custom control. Here's a, another thing that I wanted to show you as far as the uh, the stats. There's two different ways you can do stats. With stats, you can look at them on your phone while you're at the event. You can go to the booth control, choose the booth stats, and see them live right there. Or if you're dealing with a, a group of booths or maybe an operator that's out in the field and you want to monitor your booth from afar, from a way off, then you can go to the global settings section choose booth stats. Let me get my little pointer here. Okay. You can choose booth stats right here. It displays this screen right here. Let me get the setup screen. There we go. Setup screen. Uh, if you click on add new in the top corner, okay, then you give it a name. Now the name would be something to identify that specific booth. Okay. 
So for instance, let's say you've got three or four booths out in the field and uh, you, you need to know which one is which. Well, you could name one booth one, booth two, etc. So you know what booth you're talking about, what report you're getting. Then you can choose from the next drop down the method. Now you can do it by email or you can do it by text message. Uh, you know, you can have that emailed to you, you know, on your phone or however you want to do that or text message. Then uh, how frequently you can have it done every day at the beginning of the event, at the end of the event. You can have it done every hour if you want to. Just how frequent you want that uh, sent to you. And you'll get a report on your phone uh, or in your email that, you know, details all the same things in booth stats, like how many sessions and et cetera. And also... Uh, remaining paper if you're using a built-in print driver. So that's a really nice feature, especially if you're using a, uh, a permanently installed booth that you want to just check periodically to make sure everything's going okay and uh, that you're not running out of paper without having to actually go to the event to do that. So that's a great thing there as well, booth stats. And, and you can set that all up with a phone number or email and then have it sent to you that way. Okay, uh, let's see. Um, I'm going to talk just a little bit uh, about, we talked about adding video to your slideshow, but we've also had a lot of questions about adding GIFs to the slideshow. So we'll talk about that for just a little bit. Okay, uh, animated GIFs. You can do animated GIFs in several ways, but if you want to add an animated GIF to your slideshow, you'd want to use the Copy Originals. Okay. And then choose the output with, or actually enable animations right here. And then in the settings, you can choose the different, you know, things. And you'll just have to play with that until you get the effect you want. But you can add multiple templates here for your, your, uh, uh, your different frames. So imagine each frame of your, uh, your animated GIF. Let's say it has four, eight frames, whatever. Uh, you can add a separate template so those templates can change. You can add a single template so just the photos change. It's a, something that just uh, you play with the different effects and see how you, you do that. But if you want something to move in the frame, uh, like a, an animated, you know, something moving, flashing. I've seen several different examples of really cool things that people have come up with. You can add different templates, and each template is a frame of that little animation. It's just four or five frames that just happen over and over again. You can adjust the time, so how quickly that happens, and, and all of those things. But once you get this all set up, then it would save to the folder that you have set up to save it to. So after every session, it's going to save that GIF to that folder. Once you save that to the folder, you would go here and, or actually, I'm sorry, back to the slideshow, and in the slideshow, choose Mix In Photos from Folder 1. All right, then you find that same folder that you saved your GIFs into, and that's going to uh, pick up those photos or those GIFs from that folder. Then you've got options to you know, insert however many, one, two, three, whatever, and then how often to insert them with the, the frame, number of frames. So, for example, let's say that I set that to one. All right, so what? that would do is every 20 still frames or every 20 photos it would add one uh, animated GIF. You can adjust that to you know one every other one so if you were to bring this down to say one to two then you'd have every other photo would be an animated GIF and you can just play with that and adjust that however you'd like to get the effect that you actually want to do and so that's how you would insert an animated GIF into your slideshow. Um, the uh, videos we've already talked about, you just check this box right here for showing the videos. Um, we talked a little bit about slow motion video, uh, but I wanted to touch a little bit on lighting for those things. If you're going to do the slow motion video, especially with GoPro, they require a lot of light. Uh, just uh, you know, a single light bulb or something is not going to do. So uh, they make large panels of LEDs that work great because they don't get hot. You can use hot lights if you want, but those do get hot, so you've got to be careful with that. Uh, but you can do that with a, uh, 
uh, you know, these LED panels and have uh, lighting. The, the more lighting, the better. It, you, you can't get too much. You can always, you know, add more. It's always best to stay with one type of lighting. Sometimes we'll have people say, my color looks really funny, and then we get to talking to them. They've got LED panels and fluorescent panels and just, you know, all sorts of different light sources, each one that adds its own color characteristics, and that causes the color to be, you know, unusual or different or odd. It's best to stay with one type of lighting. So, you know, all LED or all fluorescent, something like that, but stay with one type of lighting and don't mix light sources. Um, the more light, the better with slow motion because then you're going to get better uh, results. Um, I hope everybody understood all of that and uh, it made sense to you. Again, you can uh, try out all those features without going to uh, an event. Do it at, at your office or something and test all that out before you go to an event. Um, the uh, the best thing to do for you know location is not necessarily to depend on the Wi-Fi from the location. A lot of people do that. They promise you know all these things to uh, the client, and then they get there and depend on whatever Wi-Fi may be available at that venue, and you just can't predict what's going to be available or what services they're blocking. Sometimes public Wi-Fi's block email traffic and things like that. So you want to make sure that you have reliable email and, and email internet and things like that. So I would always take my own hotspot if you can. Uh, you can definitely use your own router to uh, be able to use the booth control sections and things. But I would never depend on just what might be available at the venue uh, because you just don't know what's going to be there and whether it's going to work or not. Uh, routers are inexpensive and don't cost much, and you don't have to have internet connection to use the booth control and the the uh, sharing features and things um, unless you're going to be doing text messaging. That would require internet access. But otherwise, you can do most of those things without internet access, and emails would go out once you do have internet access. Those will queue up for you. Um, if you uh, have any problems or run into any questions you have, give us a call at our uh, normal support hours Monday through Friday, 8 to 5 Central Time at 1-800-517-4522. Thank you very much and good luck with all your new uh, booth control and slow-mo features.